Hello everyone, I hope you had a good week. This week I want to talk about something that has been bugging me for, well, for a long while here on the channel and I've uh, touched on it a few times and I wanted to summarize my thoughts about it. I also did a little bit of research into uh, a new light that I have been seeing morality as in video games, that's what this video is all about, um, because I've been playing Planescape Torment and I, I got to this character that uh, that that acts as, as that talks about uh, the nature of the uh, of the moral compass in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so, if you are not aware of what I'm talking about, Dungeons and Dragons has a system, a morality system that uh, basically is like this. Uh, you can have uh, basically two axes. Uh, and a true neutral axe, or not an axe, but a point in the center. So basically you have the good, neutral, and evil axes uh, for morality, and then you have the lawful, neutral, and um, uh, chaotic for basically the other axes uh, for morality. And at the center of it all, there's the true neutral. Now, the first time I was introduced to this system, uh, it was back when I first played Bal uh, Baldur's Gate 2 for the first time. That was my first Dungeons & Dragons game that I've ever played. And of course, it's one of the most... Uh, it's one of the most complex things that you can have right at the start of the game, because you need to create a character, you need to align your character, and unless you're going with a paladin or something where your um, alignment is already chosen because you have a particular uh, you have a particular class, paladins, uh, because they are uh, effectively the followers of certain gods, depending on the god you follow, uh, you'll have that alignment, and if you fall off that alignment, you you became a, become a fallen paladin. That's how it goes in Dungeons and Dragons. But it's a really complicated uh, issue to just put up, put out there for a first-time player. So it's always something that kind of stuck with me. I kind of, I sometimes understood, sometimes I didn't because you never, you don't think about this too often, or I don't think, didn't think about this too often. And I still don't. But it's uh, it's very tricky uh, to just know exactly what your alignment is. Uh, and before anything else, I want I want to put a link up there for you. Actually, I don't know if I can put a link up there. Let's not say that. I have a link for you in the description for a channel, a uh, Devin Tart channel called For the Horde. It's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting channel because it's got a lot of quotes from characters and it says their al alignment. Uh, so uh, I actually don't have uh, the... Um, the link up with me right now, but I can I can look at it. Uh, I can I put it up on the screen. Uh, well, for example, lawful neutral. I don't know this guy, so let's not say that. Let's uh, let's go with Tony Stark over here. Uh, lawful good. We need it to be put in check. If we can't accept limitations, we're boundary le boundaryless. We're no better than the bad guys. Uh, and this is because uh, Iron Man's character. He's a very powerful guy because he's very rich. Uh, and to the point where he actually has uh, influence on the government, as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware, I'm not a big follower of um, of the movies or, or the comic books or anything. But uh, basically, this transpire transpires a lawful, good attitude, and it's very simple to understand that. But the problem is, if you really think about it, well, I say this, but I shouldn't be saying it like this. If you think about it for from a different perspective, it can become very complicated. The thing is, morality in Dungeons and Dragons, when applied to real life, is reductivist. And uh, this is an uh, unavoidable. It's simply unavoidable for two main reasons. Uh, first, and the most obvious one, and probably it's not really arguable, but I guess uh, I guess everything is arguable, it's that those morality those moralities, those two axes, actually relate to in-game lore. So, basically, the difference between what is good, what is neutral, and what is evil is actually set forth by in-game things. And you'll have demons or what, the, the Tanari, and you have the, uh, the Bators, and you know, there's all sorts of these creatures that are evil, and you have their alignment. And if you're evil, you follow them, and you are okay with them, and they're okay with you. Well, m maybe not, because there's a whole thing called the Blood War, and it's a big mess that I'm not really too familiar with. Uh, and then there's the Good Plains, uh, it's actually the planes. It's it's it's, it's a big mess uh, where that difference between what is good, neutral, and evil is actually set forth by the game. 
So it's not about what you think is good in Dungeons and Dragons, it's what the world tells you is good. So you can be an evil character, but still be good at heart. And that can add... Uh, I'm not really sure if there's any works that touch on that. I mean, I'm sure there are. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is huge, but that ca you can you could possibly think of a character that is evil, even chaotic evil. Let's say that because the the Tenari are really really mad and crazy and all that. Those are the guys from the chaotic evil side uh, of the uh, prime plane. Uh, I don't know the, what the planes are, but anyway, you can you can think of a character that is chaotic evil, but still be good at heart. Uh, but the reason for that you need you need to actually now that I think about it. There's probably quite a few stories about that from Drow. I know there's a frame, uh, Drow, I should say. Uh, I, the Drow are basically a huge uh, race of elves that uh, have been banished for being so evil. They're evil by default, that's what the Drow are. And there is a Drow hero that is not evil. But he's actually not evil. His alignment is not evil. Uh, because that's how the story is. And that's this is the biggest problem. This is my biggest problem uh, with why the setting is reductivist, because it doesn't allow you to argue. And I'll go into a little bit detail uh, later on about this, but I don't know why I'm so red today, but sure. <laughs> uh, there's a... There's a, uh, um, there's a, a... There's a big problem that I'll go into uh, in a little bit, which is how reductivist this actually is. This notion that you can't be good while being evil. Because the problem is, morality for some people, it's not, relac uh, it's not relative. Uh, for some people, it is. So, it's a discussion. It's not obvious. But I bring to you a couple of examples. Uh, so, for, for example, uh, the problem is, that what I'm trying to say is, it doesn't let you argue for yourself. In Baldur's Gate 2, or no, no, in Baldur's Gate 1, there's a situation where I am assaulted on oh, wait, oh, I am. I want to say I am. It's the player is assaulted by a thief, and he says, uh, "I want to take your money. Please give me your money, or I'll kill you." Um, and uh, and you can tell that he's drunk. Now, what do you think? What do you think a lawful good character would do? So, the good, neutral, and evil is very interesting. Uh, it's very simple to say what, what the distinction. It's a, the traditional, traditional uh, attitude toward, what, towards what is good and uh, the traditional attitude towards what is evil. Uh, at least here in the Western society, the lawful and the chaotic is way more complex to define, because you see, even in the Dungeons and Dragons lore, lawful doesn't actually is not actually outright lawful. You think, for example, one of my first attitudes... Uh, what, I'll explain what, what that means. Um, one of my first attitudes towards lawful was that I would always follow the law. It seems pretty simple, but that's not exactly how th that clear-cut. Because you see, you're being assaulted by a, uh, by a thief. Are you the arbiter as a lawful good paladin, for example? Are you the arbiter? Are you the judge there to say, this guy is stealing from me, I should send him to prison, or I should kill him, or, you know, whatever? Uh, or do you need to be chaotic for that? Do you need to say, um, this guy is evil, because you're good, chaotic good, or, I mean chaotic good here. This guy is evil, he's trying to attack me, I'm gonna kill him. Is that chaotic? Or it, Because you can look at it the other way and still be chaotic, for example. You, he eventually falls over drunk. Um, and he just he doesn't he doesn't steal from you, uh, so you could think this guy he's drunk, so he's a menace to public s safety, um, which is good, right? If you're chaotic, good. I mean, it's good. You're chaotic. You like you like people that mess with. You're chaotic. You you like people that mess with with what it's commonly accepted. So if he's drunk, all the power to you. If he's evil, you know he's not attacking you. Let him be. And that's a chaotic good action, right? But it can still be, at the same time, a lawful good action. Because you chose not to kill him. And it's lawful. You know what I mean? But you can do the same exact thing. You can let him go if you're chaotic evil. 
And if you're lawful evil, you can still let him go and still be lawful evil. So the thing is, the same exact action can be seen in all of the cardinal... Actually, those are not cardinal points because they are the sub-cardinal. I don't really know, but they can be seen in all of them. The same exact action. And this is my point. It doesn't let you argue. Another similar example later on in Baldur's Gate 2 is where you take... Um, you are given a chance. There's a, there's a cloak. Uh, in, a, in a pedestal, and you enter there. It, this is all in a, in a in a pocket plane, so it's all kind of kind of crazy, really. Uh, there's there's a, there's a cloak in um, in a pedestal, and you're told that the cloak is made from the skin of nymphs, and it, nymphs are not like um, nymphs are not like um, uh, what, what's the name of them? There there's some there's some creatures that actually attack you and are kind of mean and, and nasty. Excuse me. Not like suc succubi, nothing like that. The nymphs are powers of nature. They they they're they're aligned with with nature, and it's it's gen they're they're considered good in in the setting. So again, this all go goes back to what the setting tells you they are. Uh, so they are there's a cloak made with their skin. Now you're on your quest to destroy a person that is going to destroy a whole race. It's going to destroy a plane, and it's just going to be a mess, and just terrible things are going to happen. And then and the cloak is very good. The cloak is actually very good. It, it pr protects you from uh, uh, being taken over from mind effects, which is pretty awesome. Well, it would be pretty awesome earlier in the game, but it's late in the game. Anyway, uh, it's a very good cloak. What would you say if you took it? I mean, the nymphs are dead, I suppose, unless they go about skinless, which, you know, I suppose, I don't know. And I don't really understand. Maybe they just take a little bit of a strip of... They have a bunch of nymphs and they strip out a little bit of flesh. And, and just make the cloak out of that. I don't. It's not given the 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 uh, the, um, the explanation. But what is it if you take the cloak? The game considers that as chaotic evil. Why? I I remember because I did this on my let's play, and my character was chaotic neutral. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it was a wild mage, so I I, I kind of I was playing him, riding the line between between good and evil, but never really leaning to one side. Just chaotic in general. And I saw that as a, I, I saw that as, as quite obviously ambivalent uh, towards being good and evil. Actually, I thought that it was a neutral thing, a chaotic neutral thing. But when I took that, the game transformed me into a chaotic evil character. It changes the alignment, which goes to another issue, but it's not really the issue that we're discussing here. Uh, that is the issue of um, how easy it is to fall, but it's not as easy to rise. Uh, but that's that's just a normal thing in, in the lore of Dungeons and Dragons. So anyway. The thing is, you are not given a chance to argue. The game judges you, the setting judges you, based on your decision. Now, how does it do that? That's the all other. That's the all other point. Um, the of why it removes nuance, because either it does two things. Either it allows you. This is on video games more specifically. Either it allows you to make ambivalent choices. And he then forces you to explain yourself why you chose that, and then judges you based on your explanation, which is heavy-handed, but at least works. And Baldur's Gate doesn't actually do this, unfortunately, uh, at least not too often. Or, and this is the more problematic aspect of uh, the problematic side of this, it is it forces you into drastic choices, and this is when a morality system in a role-playing game actually is detrimental to role-playing. Not just because, not just because it um, it's all ambiguous and you need to explain yourself, and uh, it's better to just remove that ambiguity. But the fact that you will see options that are quite clearly this or that, you'll see, oh, this is the lawful neutral option, this is the lawful uh, lawful good option, and all that sort of stuff. Um, or it will be just not usually you you won't have nine options, unfortunately. I mean, you should have more, but you won't have nine options. You'll have like three or four, and it's a combination of all of those that kind of shift you in this or that direction, depending on the situation. But that removes the immersion, and it removes the realism from the setting. Now, this is... Um, this applies to, to good characters, but it also applies to evil characters, and it's kind of harder to understand uh, it's even, I say it's kind of hard, it's even harder to understand the differences between a lawful evil character and a lawful good character. Uh, sorry, a lawful evil and a chaotic evil. Uh, and of course, you know, it's all a big mess, so it, it needs to be the setting to, to define that. I want to read to you the description for the alignment system 
in Baldur's Gate for a few ones. Let's not stick with the good ones. So uh, with the well, with the good ones, with the, with the good alignments. So it's a little bit easier for for me to uh, to just explain what I mean by how reductivist this is and how it reduces your choice uh, rather than enhancing it. Um, lawful good. Let's start with lawful good. Is known as the saintly or crusader alignment, and this is very rooted in the setting and the lore. This is saintly here, actually is saintly. They are they're followers of certain gods, and the Crusader actually is Crusader. This is very much what Lawful Good is. A Lawful Good character typically acts with compassion, which starts off immediately as... What? What? What was that? How, do you, how are you a Crusader and act with compassion? And always with honor and a sense of duty. Now this uh, this is the mix this is what they're trying to, to say compassion is because it's good and honor and sense of duty it's because it's lawful now this can come crashing into itself and it's fun to uh, to to think of that if duty forces you to not be compassionate and the other way around uh, and you can have drama because of this because your alignment is crazy but this is not the only alignment, all the alignments are crazy. Let's continue. A lawful good nation, oh look at this. A lawful good nation would consist of a well-organized government that works for the benefit of its own citizens. Lawful good characters include righteous knights, righteous knights, very important, paladins, which, you know, is just a made-up term, but effectively the same thing, uh, and most dwarves, and that's a race that is most uh, mostly good. Lawful good creatures include, oh it's just saying, saying noble golden dragons, it's very racist, it's how it is, uh, it's because it's founded on mythology, the mythology of Tolkien, and Dungeons and Dragons is like this. It's, I, I don't know if they eased uh, out of that uh, in later versions or little mythos, but because it is mytho mythology, racism, like, you know, all, dwarves will always be good and d drows will always be evil, uh, that's that's accepted because it is mythology, <clears throat> or it's written as mythology anyway. Lawful good, uh, lawful good outsiders are known as Archons. Okay, so this is just the setting. But think of this. A lawful good nation is a well-organized government. Organized crime, anybody? Uh, that works for the benefits of its citizens. And... There are... Th just think of any marauding marauding nation throughout history that is well organized the, think of the northern think of the vikings for example they were well organized to the point where they changed to survive they were so well organized that they changed raiding was not uh, such a prevalent aspect of, of the viking society well actually it was because the vikings were the vikings anyway the northern society i guess let's put it like that the norse society uh it was not such a vital vital point that they couldn't let it go because they did let it go, but it also kind of defined them, especially in the eyes of the southern of the southern country, uh, countries and the countries that dealt directly with them. So you can you can say that any with this example, you can say that any government, any country that is good to its citizens, not the other ones, the citizens there, and it doesn't it's it doesn't talk about slavery, it doesn't talk about who is considered citizens or not, like differences between races or gender or whatever. Uh, it, as long as it treats its citizens well and it's well organized, it's lawful good. You see how flimsy it is? This is, let's compare it to Torment's, uh, the, I'm talking about Planescape Torment, uh, Torment's defini definition of lawful good. And it's still flimsy, but it's a little bit better in that regard, and that's the problem. It's very hard to bring a definition that is explainable in a, such, a, such a short and small um, line. Lawful good characters strongly believe in order, as, as in opposition to chaos, which are the chaotic characters, and the betterment of life for others. Their definition of betterment of life and the others can vary, however. Yeah. So it's just saying... It's... I mean, it's establishing a very definite de distinction from chaotic, but it doesn't say what good is. It's, it says directly that it's their definition of what good is, of what the betterment of life is for others. So when you enslave an entire population, you remove their um, th their way of life, their traditions, their family ties, everything, and you think that it's better for them, so you're good. Look at that. <laughs> you see the problem here? Uh, let's, let's pick the chaotic good ones. For example, Torment says chaotic good characters aren't concerned with structure or order. 
they are individualists who tend toward performing acts of kindness. So again, it's same. It's the same exact thing. It's kind of a cop out, really, because you're saying they are individualists, which you know just explains that they are chaotic. They they don't believe in the order, the overall order. Uh, so you're establishing very well here what is lawful and what is chaotic, but you're not establishing. You're saying just acts of kindness. I, I'm not even gonna mind the tend towards because that's just a, a, a means the the way they wrote that. So they perform acts of kindness. That's what chaotic good is. Uh, but you're still yourself, you know what I mean? So, if you're rebellious, think of this, think of this like this. You have a country, you live in a country that is well-organized and betterment for the life of your, uh, of the citizens. And you're not a citizen, and so they treat you poorly. Um, and you are gonna rebel against the government. Are you immediately chaotic? Or, be because maybe not, maybe you see that as unlawful. Maybe you see the government as unlawful and you just put a new order in it. Are you chaotic? Do you need to turn chaotic? I'm gonna put on my chaotic clothes and I'm, then I'll put my lawful good chaotic, uh, lawful good uh, clothes after the rebellion is done. You know what I mean? So it's really tricky. But again, back to Baldur's Gate, um, the definition in Baldur's Gate. Chaotic good is known as beatific, which means saintly again, rebel, uh, or cynic hmm. uh, alignment. A chaotic good character favors change for a greater good, disdains bureauc bureaucratic organizations that get in the way of social improvement, which is not actually, they disdain everything, otherwise it's just, they disdain everything, otherwise they would be lawful, uh, and uh, places a high value on personal freedom, not only for oneself, but for others as well. But still, they're chaotic good. Uh, they always intend to do the right thing, but their methods are generally disorganized and often out of alignment with the rest of society. They may create conflict in a team if they... This is more... Okay, so, yeah. So, basically, you see how flimsily, flimsy it all is. You can say certain things are this sort of thing, but it's more of a joke, usually, other than, than an actual thing, because you can see it in multiple lights. Pick this example over here. Uh, character favors change for a greater good. So a greater good. You can. This is. This go back. Goes back to what I. To what I was saying before. What if you. What if you're evil? What if you think the forces of destruction, and um, the forces that will that destroy the world and send people to their death, is the good way of doing things? What if you think that? It's the. It's you're still fighting for the greater good. It just because you have a different perspective. And in Dungeons and Dragons, you might not actually be wrong on that account. <laughs> That's the crazy thing, is that in Dungeons and Dragons you actually have an afterlife, you actually have the astral plane where, I think it's the astral plane, where everybody that dies goes to, well not everybody, at least not in Planescape, but you have planes and then you have, if you ever played Neverwinter Nights to the first expansion, I don't remember the, the name, uh, Mask of the Betrayer, brilliant, brilliant expansion, it's just so well written, it's fantastic, but if you ever played it you know what I'm talking about here, it's crazy. It's crazy, I was playing a chaotic, it, and it's, it, it really plays with this, it, and you will play that expansion on the channel, just because it really plays with these definitions. I was playing a chaotic good character, and at the end of the game, I saw my character be turned by the game into a chaotic evil character. And I was like, what is wrong? How, this, how did this even happen? So I had to just backtrack a bunch and just really understand, because I had to think a lot about what happened, because it is really hard to understand if you're not ready for what Dungeons & Dragons actually has in store for you. So what I mean is an evil character, a chaotic evil character that wants to destroy the whole, or the whole world, can still have the greater good in mind. So is he chaotic good? Disdain bureaucratic organizations that get in the way of social improvement. What is social? What is improvement? I mean, social is pretty simple, it's the interactions, the social interactions between people. But if you think they all should all be dead so they could be part of a greater mind, imagine just... Um, I don't think they, that actually is a possibility in Dungeons & Dragons, where everybody's soul gets into a single god, maybe it is, I don't know. But if you think that's the best thing, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You see what I'm in, world! Anyway, this is a big rant. Uh, and I just wanted to explain my stance on uh, on this whole thing. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. I, me I mean to do a proper video, not a weekend update, but a proper video with uh, 
things appearing more, things appearing on the screen than they are right now um, about this whole thing. But I want to hear from you, I want to hear your, your perspective, even if you uh, want to disregard part of what I said and just if, even if you just want to give your perspective uh, that you already brought to this video, go ahead, just tell me. Uh, if I made you more confused about the whole thing, uh, don't feel ashamed for, to, to say what you thought before, it's fine. If you just know exactly why I'm wrong and if I'm wrong, go ahead and tell me. <laughs> but above all, thank you very much for watching. Uh, stay tuned for uh, the next little bit because we're going to talk about more things. That's right. YouTube editor is going away in September. Thank you very much, Levy Parish, for uh, for telling me. Uh, so I, I missed that news because uh, let me tell you what YouTube editor is. So basically, when you upload a video to YouTube, and you can do this, anybody can upload a video to YouTube. Um, when you upload a video to YouTube, you're given a choice of uh, enhancing that video with uh, like gamma, contrast, color adjustments, all all manner of tiny little things that you can make to the video. But this is not the YouTube editor. What the YouTube editor is, is basically an online, in the cloud, effectively, um, video editor that YouTube gives you. It's kind of hard to get, which is, uh, it's kind of hard to get to, which is kind of a, it's a pain that it's hard It's hard to get to. You need to go into edit the video. Actually, I can, I can tell you how I do it. Well, actually, I have it bookmarked because it's always the same thing. But the link is weird. Uh, you need to go into enhancements for a video, which is the thing, and then at the bottom left corner, or bottom right corner, there's a button that's not even red or anything. It's just a small button that looks like crap that says YouTube Editor. So what you do there is have a very basic YouTube Editor, and I use it for pretty much everything, except for these videos, except for uh, the uh, weekend updates, because I need more transitions, I need PNGs, and YouTube doesn't let you do that, uh, which is images and stuff. Anyway, um... So, apparently, less than 0.1% of YouTube creators, so they're not even saying YouTube users, which is good, but apparently only less than 0.1%, which is one per mil, uh, of YouTube creators use that. And I would say that's a huge amount of people, for starters. Um, but that is the excuse that YouTube is using to remove that feature. Um, and uh, I say that's bullcrap, really. There's a big... There's, there's, there's more to that than just that, but the thing is, first off, that is... Uh, uh, first off, people say it's not good. YouTube editor is not good. Yeah, YouTube editor is not good, but it works for small things. And the good thing about it is that it actually allows you to edit on the fly anywhere. And the good thing about it is that you don't need to turn your have your computer on while it encodes. YouTube does that for you, and that is the reason why YouTube doesn't want to put this, uh, doesn't want to keep this up. Uh, I, I think a, about a year ago, uh, or before a year ago, they actually allowed you to make. Uh, I think it was four-hour videos. Edit four-hour videos, which was amazing because I could do my uh, highlights easily enough. Um, in, in uh, the YouTube editor for my streams. Uh, but about a year ago, they stopped. They, they, uh, they denied the one... They put a one-hour limit for the, uh, for the videos that you can make on a YouTube editor. And the reason for that is because of processing power. YouTube is huge. And YouTube actually operates at a loss. Which is crazy to think of. It's absolutely crazy to think of because... They're enormous, so many people gain their daily wages or monthly wages, whatever, with YouTube, and YouTube operates at a loss. It's everything else around it that turns a profit for Google, and uh, I think they're trying to trim it down, especially now with uh, more and more streaming and more and more just... There's just so many people uploading so many stuff to YouTube uh, that they need to cut costs, and that's what they're doing. And I respect that. I don't want YouTube to go away. Uh, and I respect that they can say that outright, because there's shareholders, there's a whole lot of I different issues. But I don't believe for a moment that they're removing this feature because... Because they... Because few people use it. They haven't updated it in years. It just stays there. It's It works. It kind of is a problem that it requires, still requires Flash, but whatever. It requires Flash, but, you know, whatever. Uh, but the problem is the same, the, the reason why they're removing it is because it costs a lot of CPU power. And I understand that. I respect that. I hope YouTube's easier to stay for a long while. This is not gonna affect me, even though I use YouTube Editor. But, uh, it's, well, it's gonna affect me, but it's not gonna affect the, the 
the um, output of videos. I'm not gonna spend more money doing more. Actually, I'm gonna spend more money, but I'm not gonna spend more time doing my work. It's just I'm gonna need to let, let my computer t be turned on during the night because um, it's gonna be encoding and all that sort of stuff. But that's that. Just wanted to let you know if uh, if you use if you're a YouTube creator and if you use YouTube editor, uh, just be ready because it's going away. Uh, there's there's free stuff out there. But I'm probably not gonna. I'm, I I use a, a, a free editor right now. I uh, use actually I can tell you the name. It's crap. It's really crap, but it works and it's free. It's Cyberlink Power Editor 12. And it's an old version as well, I think. Uh, but it, yeah, it works kind of sometimes. It sometimes gets everything. It's it's kind of works, but it works. Um, and it's free, so uh, I probably will. I don't know, get like something from Adobe or something. I mean, I already have Photoshop. I just need to update my um, license. So yeah, uh, that's that for YouTube editor. <sighs> and it's been a couple of weeks since I did my last YouTube, uh, my last weekend update. Last weekend I was just swarmed with work. This weekend I am as well, but I have a little bit more time. I have a couple of hours to do this. So um, yeah. Uh, so I'm here again, and I hope to always be here for the weekend updates. But this week, this couple of weeks, there are. Four new RPGs that came out, uh, and one of them is actually interesting, uh, which is great. And well, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that I'm being mean. I'm being mean. I find one of them to be interesting. Let's put it like that. Uh, so, Hate Free Heroes RPG uh, has been released. I got links for you for all these things down uh, down below. So if you want to check them out. I can go directly to their Steam store page and just check them out. Uh, so, just a brief overview. Hate Free Heroes RPG, or HFH RPG, is uh, a JRPG, uh, but the description has HFH without a dot after the last H, so I stopped reading. Uh, Catacombs 1 Demon War, apparently it's part of a trilogy, and uh, it's a story-heavy retro-style dungeon crawler that looks actually kind of interesting. Some people are saying it's boring, some people are saying it's fun. It costs $4.99, so you might want to check it out, uh, and uh, it actually looks interesting if you have time to check it out. Devoid of Shadows is a new, uh, another game. It's an indie action RPG. It looks interesting, it looks, you know, competent. The title is a little bit off. I it sounds a little bit off. Devoid of shadows, <sighs> but apparently I, I read some of the reviews. That apparently translations are a little bit iffy. So um, yeah, you might want to look into that. Uh, I just don't have time for an for an action RPG indie or not at the moment. And uh, the last one, and the one that actually I find to be the more in the most interesting, Children of the Zodiacs. Uh, which is a tactical RPG with uh, a JRPG style. I don't think it's made by uh, any Japanese or Asian studio, uh, but it has an interesting way of doing fights with cards and all sorts of stuff, and it's very story-heavy, uh, and it's, uh, from what I've seen, because I've been watching uh, Bumpy McSqueakum's Let's Play of it, uh, it is very well-written, I really enjoy it. So, uh, links for you in the description for all of these, and, uh, yeah, well, next week uh, there's gonna be more, hopefully. So what have I been watching this week, or these last couple of weeks? A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. I've been watching a lot of stuff. Uh, but uh, this week I bring to you an interesting video about rendering in Blender, specifically. It's a very interesting channel that focuses on that. Uh, and uh, it's called The Secret Ingredient to Photorealism. It's a little bit clickbaity because of that, but it isn't clickbaity because it is exactly what it is. It's a secret ingredient in Blender for photorealism, and it's kind of weird. Uh, and the video does a very good job of explaining it. Uh, so if you're interested in that, even if you're just interested in the process of color and uh, 3D and uh, just lighting and all that sort of stuff, feel free to give it a look. I got a link for you up there if you want to check it out. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to bring that one to your attention. <laughs> And as always, I want to thank you very much for watching, for supporting me through comments, likes, subscribing, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> but especially to those of you that support me on Patreon. And uh, this week I launched my Patreon-only Discord. I'm still looking into other things, if I will open it to other people or how that's gonna go. But uh, Discord access uh, is a reward that I've had on my Patreon campaign uh, for a little while, among other things. You, you can check it out up there. Check it, check it out. Look, look, look into it up there, got a link for you up there to support me on Patreon. Just look at it, just see the rewards 
Uh, I mean, I do realize that uh, it's just it. Uh, it's the it's the least I can do to to those of you that actually support me there, uh, because it is Patreon is simply a crowdfunding platform. It's not it it it's really hard to work with it as a, as anything other than that. So those rewards are just rewards. They're not actually the point. You shouldn't you shouldn't uh, give me money because you want those. You, you, I, it's just it's crowdfunding really, but the rewards are there and uh, one of them was the discord So I, I launched the I launched the discord server got a link for you on the uh, on the patreon page if you're my patron uh, And if you join me uh, Basically if you join me like today, for example You only get access to patron stuff uh, to pay patron only stuff at the beginning of next month because that's how patron works It's at the beginning of each month. It uh, it takes uh, the your your pledge from your credit card or your bank account or however you're paying it so um, yeah so it's only at the beginning of, uh, of each month that you get access uh, if you are you know it's only the beginning of the first month that you get access since any from then you just get access because you're a patron uh, so yeah thank you very much for those of you that support me that's Rob anybody Robert Daffern Paul Bible Joshua A. Ennis Michael Grayson Christopher Chilton Grigory Krasikov the Mad Larkin Andre Foral Atom Collider and Eric Todd, thank you so much for supporting me. I hope you've been enjoying the um, the, the, the stay at the RPG Army. Thank you very much. And this week I was looking for quotes about morality. There's a lot of stuff out there, there because morality just works so intrinsically with religion and with the definition of, uh, with so many definitions of, of social interactions and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I found a brilliant quote that I didn't know, of, I say brilliant, but really, it's a very interesting, it's, it's thought-provoking, uh, a, a thought-provoking quote by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and he's got a lot of quotes, but uh, I didn't know this one from him. I, uh, I just found it, and I found it interesting because, to me, it seems paradoxical. But I'm sure to others it might not. Uh, and I, I think I understand what he means, but let's let me just read it to you. I reject any religious doctrine that does not appeal to reason and is in conflict with morality. I'm gonna let you dwell on that. I think it's a very good quote, because it provokes thought. So thank you very much for watching, I will see you next weekend, bye bye!